Um, before Secretary Skinner arrives, uh, let us turn to some other matters before the committee. Uh, we have before us two proposed policy positions, one on international air service negotiations and the other on national transportation policy. And I'll ask Governor O'Neill to introduce and describe to us the proposed amendment to F3 on air transportation. Governor O'Neill. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Going along with what has already been discussed by Mr. Sykes pertaining to the economic community in Europe and the realities of it in 1992 are upon us and one European economic community which will reap significant benefit through the elimination of multiple currencies and border red tape and formalities and other trade barriers seeped in history. One area of immediate concern is the development of a more efficient and responsive international air transportation system which meets the needs of both travelers and shippers and providing more expedient means of international air service. Over the past year, a group named USA BIAS, or U.S. Airports for Better International Air Service, was formed with representatives from Connecticut and over 20 other states and cities and communities and airports. And the purpose of USA BIAS has been to actively and aggressively promote a change in the U.S. international aviation policy to reflect the economic importance of direct international air service to numerous underserved airports in our respective states. The new direct international air service between these airports and Europe would offset any possible EC advantage and provide many small businesses with new international trade opportunities, new jobs, and millions of dollars in benefits to the states directly involved, neighboring states, as well as their respective local communities. Moreover, a change in international aviation policy would substantially reduce congestion at many of our already overcrowded and overburdened airports and roadways, thereby eliminating reoccurring delay and expense for both air travelers and the shippers. Today, therefore, I'm proposing addition to the National Governors Association aviation policy to reflect our commitment to this important effort. This proposal does not replace existing policy, but merely amplifies it the results of which will benefit each state, its international trade efforts, and the traveling public in general. And that would be yes. F3 air transportation, and I would move that resolution, Madam Chair. Thank you, Governor O'Neill. Governor Thompson? Madam Chairman, I would like to, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to second the policy. Uh, I'd also like to point out for the Transportation <coughs> Committee that uh, the International Relations Committee, which I chair, passed the same resolution yesterday. So. Uh, we'll have two committees uh, supporting this uh, very important resolution, and it's a great deal of uh, pride that I second it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Other than to say, I think it's very timely with Secretary of Skinner about to appear in front of us at this particular <laughs> meeting this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. We have him captive for a while, don't we, Governor? Any other discussion? Hearing none, I will ask for a vote on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Hearing none, the, the motion has been adopted. Yes, Governor O'Neill. Uh, prior to getting into the trust fund, which probably will be quite a conversation in itself, uh, we also passed the resolution today pertaining to the international gateway status of some of the smaller, so-called smaller airports. And I was wondering, Mr. Secretary, where does that stand in the process? I'm concerned naturally with Bradley right. Field, which is Hartford Springfield. <laughs> Uh, which we're ready to go and a, and a carrier ready to come in. And I'm just concerned as to where that stands as far as the process of okaying or whatever the case okay. may be. Yes, uh, Governor O'Neill. What this process is is a concept that uh, we've developed at the department that basically if in fact uh, there is uh, cities in this country that wish international service and we have no domestic carrier that wants to provide that service and that service is available from a foreign carrier from a country where we have an open skies regime, uh, we will encourage service by that foreign carrier, even though there may not be a domestic carrier, you know, paralleling that service. Uh, and a number of cities have expressed interest in that. We have published a rule uh, for the implementation of that. Uh, I am optimistic that uh, we will have something uh, towards the spring or, or early summer that we will release in final form. Uh, one of the things that you've got to, to make sure, uh, I would note, is that number one, you've identified an airline, which in your case I believe you have. We have. Uh, number two, that airline 
in many cases being a national airline or you know having a close relationship with its government, uh, that that comes from a country that allows us the kind of access we're giving them. Uh, and then finally, that they're serious uh, about offering that service. Uh, one situation we found that we had about nine cities that an airline had gone around to, uh, a foreign airline, indicating that they would be willing to consider providing service, but there was really only going to be three services out of the nine available. So, so once you've validated that, I think you'll be in a position, uh, I would assume, to by early, late spring, early summer, uh, to offer that service. Thank you. And it is a step, I think, in uh, a very dramatic step forward. Uh, one of the problems on international aviation, as long as we're on the issue, and then, is that we've got to open up these markets. Markets in many parts of the, uh, of the world are restricted. And uh, we, as a nation, and our carriers can compete with any carrier in the world as long as we have open access to those markets. And we've got to do everything we can to encourage, uh, through the bilateral process or other processes, to make sure that those markets are open to us so we can open ours to them. Now, to move on to the next item on our agenda, the National Transportation Policy Principles. I anticipate there's going to be quite a bit of discussion on this subject, but let's begin by having Governor Jim Thompson introduce the proposal, and a second and after that, we'll have some discussion. Governor Thompson. Yes, Madam Chairman, thank you. While the document is long and comprehensive, it essentially restates much of the policy of the governors towards transportation uh, in America and our role together with the federal government, with certain changes that have been brought about by challenges that we face as states and as a nation in the past several years. I anticipate that we will not only have uh, uh, extensive discussion on the policy, but I believe there is an amendment to be offered as well by, by the other Governor Thompson, my neighbor. The document uh, places emphasis on things that we have found to be important, <coughs> especially in light of the hearings and report of our task force on transportation infrastructure, which was uh, reported and accepted at our annual meeting last summer. The first and of greatest importance to the states is our absolute insistence not only on spending the dollars accumulating in the transportation trust funds <coughs> that now serve one purpose and one purpose only to paper over the deficit. In my view, and I think in the view of all governors, a direct violation of the promises of the federal government when it increased the transportation taxes in 1982 but also under the budget that has been proposed by the administration, the ceiling in effect has been lowered. And we would be deprived of almost $300 million of transportation revenue that we would ordinarily see spending this year because demonstration projects and others are placed under the ceiling for the first time. And I don't think we can state strongly enough our dissatisfaction with that kind of policy, both in the law and in the budget. As the document says, the trust has to be restored to the Transportation Trust Fund. The document also cautions against diversions from the trust fund revenue sources and the impacts of other policies, for example, with regard to alternative fuels, but it does not reach any final conclusions in this regard in respect to the developing uh, agenda of the nation uh, concerning alternative fuels, and I think that change which I think uh, the chairman's staff suggested is a good one, and I agree with it. Uh, we place an emphasis on flexibility in new transportation programs. Secretary Skinner told us a year ago what he intended to do with regard to changing some of the uh, uh, matching ratios in, a, in an attempt to leverage additional investment by local, state, and uh, private sources. And we, on the other hand, would like to see increasing flexibility in the programs that not only remain, but that are to be created by the new transportation policy from Secretary Skinner and the President, which we all await. Consistent with the recommendations of the Transportation uh, Task Force of last summer, 
the policy also emphasizes the need to study increased privatization of transportation modes in the United States, at least through demonstration projects. It calls for making sure that transportation funding formulas are equitable to all states and territories. It calls for a renewed uh, emphasis on keeping in good shape the existing transportation system with the virtual completion of the interstate uh, obligations of the federal government. We are caught in a tremendous trap, Madam Chairman, because gallonage taxes are decreasing as efficiency of engines improves, and yet the system keeps getting bigger and older, and the widening gap between resources and needs is at a critical point for the nation. Policy also emphasizes the special problems of both urban congestion and rural linkage, important to my state and important to all the states of the nation. I urge its adoption. Thank you, Governor Thompson, and may I say thank you also for the hard work that you've done, and I want to recognize that a great deal of effort has been put forth. It's greatly appreciated. Governor O'Neill, I'm, uh, I'm looking for a second, and second. I understand. Um, We'll go into discussion, and um, but I know that we have a Governor Goldschmidt has come in, in the room would like to be recognized for a brief comment because he is taking the lead on this issue with the Western Governors Association. So, Governor Goldschmidt, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you, Governor. I'd like to join you in thanking Governor Thompson of Illinois for uh, his effort on the infrastructure, particularly on transportation, and uh, it was fun to be with you for the brief part of the time I was on the road. The draft policy that uh, this committee has before it recognizes the opportunity that we in the states, particularly governors, have to shape the 1992 surface transportation reauthorizations. I'd like to talk for a minute today about the interstate system. Current program authorization for maintenance of the interstate system, as my numbers are right, is about $2.8 billion. Essentially what has happened is that the maintenance of this national asset has been transferred increasingly to the states. This is a national system of highways that links all of us together. It provides the greatest economic return of any portion of the federal highway infrastructure. While it comprises only 1% of the nation's highway mileage, this 43,000 mile system currently handles 21% of the vehicle miles that we all account for. This is the one place the United States government can actually say it has made a major investment. They've invested uh, about $100 billion and uh, if you look at the current federal maintenance levels, this system is either going to be maintained by the states having to raise its own gas taxes, thus diverting money from systems the federal government never has treated principally its own, or do what I saw when I was secretary, and I think some governors have seen literally potholes start developing on the interstate system. We, I, don't, I don't think we have the resources to do this and keep the promises to the farm communities and the places that are off the interstate. My own view is, and we are trying to describe this as carefully as we can in the Western Governors, is that the federal government, above all, ought to commit itself to ensuring that this national system of highways is maintained properly. It was a pleasure for me to see Jim Florio come to join us here because when I was in the cabinet, I worked with him on railroad uh, deregulation and, and uh, the development of a sensible railroad system. But I think nothing shocked me more than seeing a railroad system in which we had left the decision to a railroad economy that let them decide whether they invested in their own tracks. And then we sent our safety inspectors out to slow down the trains when we decided they weren't safe because the tracks weren't maintained. It is inconceivable to a nationally productive economy that will let this happen state by state, have the political decision made to maintain or not maintain the interstate system. And I think it is a national view, I think most governors ascribe to it, that it's important to us. It's a little bit tough politics, as we all know, because some people have lots and lots of miles of interstate and others don't. But if my friends from the Dakotas were here with small populations and large, long miles of interstate through which trucks from Oregon pass, they would say, folks, if you want to have these things connect the farms of the Midwest with the harbors in Seattle and Portland, you're going to have to help us, because our job is to get the farmers to the interstate so they can do something with their crops. The cost of doing a fully maintained interstate system, and I'm not talking about widening and all the bells and whistles, is about $6.4 billion. So we're $3.6 billion short, all of which is being moved on to the states. Now, finally, let me say that I do not mean to imply that this is the only transportation objective we have or that it is the only one 
that the federal government ought to have. Interstate preservation need not come at the expense of other highway and transit program. Interstate preservation at current match levels, together with some kind of a hold harmless approach, I think would leave us all both with flexibility and an insurance that the uh, sort of the spine that holds America together is taken care of. I appreciate the opportunity to appear. I appreciate the work of the committee and look forward as uh, the months go on, the short months I have left in office over the next year and being whatever help I can in the reauthorization. Thank you, Governor Goldschmidt, and I will remind you, Nebraska is one of those less populated states right. with a good number of miles and very dependent on a good, uh, safe interstate system to transport our products. Any discussion or on this uh, policy that's been introduced? One second. Governor O'Neill. Uh, well, Governor Goldschmidt is still here. Uh, just like to point out that I was one of those unfortunate governors that lost a bridge on our interstate system back in 1983 on I-95 in the town of Greenwich over a river, and three people were killed, numerous people were injured. And because of that tragedy, we in Connecticut passed a infrastructure rebuilding program across our state. And even though we're a very small geographic sized state, 100 miles roughly by 50, to fix all the highways, roads, bridges owned by the state it was a $6 billion project within the state of Connecticut. So that kind of puts things in perspective of what these costs really are out there across the country. This is a 10-year program. Would have never gone through the legislature, of course, without the tragedy of the bridge collapse. That's what it took. But those are the kinds of dollars you're talking about. And when neglect takes place over the years, it's a mighty expensive free building project. As introduced by Governor Jim Thompson, Governor Florio. Madam Chairman, I, I support this, and I think it's something that's highly desirable. I would just like to, to highlight one aspect of it, uh, one that calls for improved intermodal linkage. Uh, the governor's recognized the importance of improved intermodal connections, and that's obvious and it's something that we should be uh, speaking out on. I guess I would just also, um, while we are attempting to encourage affirmative improvements in intermodal connections and things of that sort, just to call everyone's attention to the fact that we should, um, at, at a minimum, be attempting to discourage policies which disrupt the intermodal connections that we have now. Um, I, I would point to things like the defunding of Amtrak, which is currently being contemplated. Um, to, to the Northeast Carter system uh, currently transports 17,000 people a day. If that were defunded, if in fact uh, the system no longer operated, those people would be going into the already overcrowded airports and overcrowded highway connections in the area. I note that we're going to have someone here from UMTA. In many instances, if you uh, take out of the mix something like Amtrak, the, the commuter rail systems that use portions of the trackage uh, would have to be picked up to a greater extent by the states at a time when the UMTA funding is being reduced to give extra burdens onto the state's commuter rail systems while you take away the assistance at the federal level is the very opposite of facilitating greater intermodal connections. So I just hope that in our stating that we desire greater cooperation in intermodal transportation connections, we do not in any way miss the opportunity to point out that at least we should not be doing violence to the intermodal connections that we have now while we move forward to try to enhance the potential for intermodal connections. Thank you, Governor Florio. It's Governor Florio again, please. Just while we have the minute, I, I would just like to uh, urge that at some point, I'll be happy to talk with all the other members, under our commerce jurisdiction mm -hmm. on this committee, to see if perhaps we could lift the level of awareness um, of this committee to the importance of insurance. Insurance in the Congress is under the commerce provisions, and I'm convinced that the, the insurance issues that are going to be upon us as a nation not only the specific areas, health insurance, auto insurance, are going to grow in importance, but the, the whole question of the, the regulation of the insurance industry is something that I think states should start to talk more about together. That I think in the, in, in the industry, there's a sense that in the mid-early 90s, there are going to be some serious solvency problems in the industry. There is no FDIC, obviously, for insurance company insolvencies. We're already starting to see more and more of them. And there may be some value in the governors starting to focus a bit upon this very important part of the financial services industry. So I would um, urge, and perhaps we could at some point in the not too distant future, consider launching some, some initiatives into this area. Thank you, Governor Florio. I've been advised that uh, 
sometimes in sorting out assignments to the committee that the executive committee has assigned that to the economic development committee. So you can follow that issue very closely, I think, Thank with you. them. So please point. Governor Wilkinson. Thank you, Governor Orr. Um, um, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here this morning. I, I just want to quickly add that <clears throat> I'm going to get an invitation to the Kentucky Derby out to you so we can maintain the Sam and Wallace relationship that we started. Tommy's going to invite you to something, too. At the executive committee meeting yesterday morning, uh, I asked um, Secretary, uh, our Budget Director Darman a question that I said, uh, <clears throat> DOT seems to be in agreement that uh, we could, uh, could raise the obligation ceiling basically on a cash-in, cash-out basis. So then in 1991, um, if we just for a moment set aside the argument and the debate about what the cash balance is in the Highway Trust Fund, just kind of defer that for a moment and look at 1991 receipts. And I said, would it be reasonable to expect that on a cash-in, cash-out basis referring to the obligation ceiling, and I wanted to include the interest, of course, as well, <laughs> that in 1991, Mr. Secretary, that um, we could pay out the $15 billion plus interest. And it seemed to me that DOT says that's possible. It seems to me that GAO says that is possible. And it also seemed to me that Mr. Darman agreed with us yesterday, um, <laughs> except for the interest. Uh, and he oh, was quick to point is, that out. <laughs> that's three billion a year. But I understand. <laughs> uh, w w would you comment on that? And would, would you comment on, on whether you believe that my understanding of what's been said by Mr. Darman and DOT and, and, uh, and, and the General Accounting Office is, in fact, correct? Well, let me, uh, I did have a brief conversation after your session with, you know, with Director Darman last night, uh, and we've agreed to uh, discuss it again. Uh, I don't want to speak for him. Uh, I will tell you that in my 15 months or so of dealing with Director Darman, I think we have a director of the Office of Management and Budget who understands the importance of investment in infrastructure to keep this country competitive. Uh, I have, uh, I think you have an individual who does have the vision and understanding that when we invest in infrastructure, uh, we invest uh, in America. And uh, he has demonstrated that this year with the research uh, increases for the FAA and other department, uh, department budgets. He has demonstrated that with a significant increase in the FAA budget for investment in uh, not uh, only uh, some of the projects you're familiar with, but also the NAS plan and other things. And our budget there is up about 13 percent, which is one of the biggest single increases in the entire federal budget. Uh, and I think he understands in surface transportation the need to make that investment. Uh, the big issue, of course, deals with the issue of, uh, of interest. Uh, basically, we have, uh, if you take, uh, put aside interest, uh, this year's budget basically s uh, spends receipts uh, slightly uh, in into the interest. But the big component that's missing uh, is, of course, the interest. Uh, my staff uh, indicated to me that if we were allowed to uh, spend up to uh, the obligation limits, for about a three-year period, we could spend about 15 billion instead of 12. Uh, but that at the end of year three, because of the outstanding obligations that exist and because of the uh, restriction uh, that Senator Byrd uh, uh, placed, uh, that requires a certain amount of reserve for projects that have been authorized but uh, but not uh, completed, that we would then have to uh, cut back uh, to a, uh, a lower level. I do not believe that the answer to our nation's infrastructure problems resides in the trust fund as it currently exists. That is a short time fix that we are trying to work with the governors and the administration in getting into the system. That is not the long term answer. The long term answer calls for substantial increase in investment in infrastructure well beyond what the trust fund can finance. But uh, we recognize 
as the President does, that we've got to start spending that down. We've done that in aviation this year, depending on how much of the operational budget uh, the FAA will uh, uh, be allowed to uh, expend from the trust fund, and we're going to move forward and surface next year. Uh, one quick uh, follow-up. Uh, uh, when, when Mr. Darman uh, referenced the bird rule, uh, we did a little research on that, and I think that uh, uh, the bird rule as such would not prevent us <laughs> from paying out, at least on a cash-in, cash-out basis, plus interest, Sam, uh, the, the uh, current year appropriation. Um, I guess the bottom line is, can we pay out in 91 what we take in in 91, uh, the bird rule notwithstanding, and I think there is general agreement that it does not apply, uh, plus interest. And I realize that all of us realize that it's not the be-all, fix-all for the infrastructure program, but it is a marvelous, giant first step that would mean about $40 million for our Commonwealth, and I don't know what it means for others. So, Mr. Secretary, we, we just appreciate an opportunity to continue to work with you uh, um, along those lines, and uh, um, I'm, in my heart, I believe you are supportive, <laughs> and uh, we thank you. Okay. Well, let me just let me just make an observation. Uh, conceptually, we have moved in this year's budget uh, towards a greater user fee and a greater uh, federally funded budget out of user fees as a concept and uh, as part of the aviation system. And it's important that the governors support that uh, because that would bode well for the ongoing years and the ongoing concepts. So, so we've got a little test case out there as to whether or not it can, we can develop the support in the Congress for this kind of approach. And I would hope that all of the governors would be supporting us in this because in the long run, it's going to pay big dividends not only for aviation but for surface transportation. Thank you, Mr. Secretary.